Good morning. Welcome to the APFA Retirement Seminar Special Medicare Edition. And if my clicker would work to change the screens. <laughs> you want to introduce yourself? We have a slide for that. Who are we? Hey, we've got Kim Coates Tuck, the APFA National Retirement Specialist. Hey, Kim. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we have uh, Evan um Phoenix-based flight attendant. She's a licensed Medicare agent specialist, and she's come to keep us in line because, you know, we get a little crazy here. Evan, pronounce your name. Uh, Evan Jealous. 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 Okay. <laughs> uh, one more cup of coffee and I'll be there. And I'm Patrick Hancock, the APFA Retirement Specialist Emeritus. I don't know. I don't think we have our pictures here. Um, they'll come up. They'll come up. There we go. Oh, oh my God. God. We're so young and cute. <laughs> yes. I don't know who those people are or where those pictures came from, but yeah. So that's who we are. Who we are not? We are not the company. This is a union meeting. And uh, I have been a union rep long enough that I have developed a really healthy skepticism of the management at my at American Airlines. And if I say something about American management that offends you, yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> um, we are not your financial advisors. We're not your attorneys. We're not your social security advisors. We're not your personal Medicare advisors, but you're in luck because today we have a Medicare advisor Yay, who's also a Phoenix based flight attendant available to answer your, your questions. All right, so that's who we are not. Here, let me talk about why we're talking about Medicare now. Um, it's really important because guess what? Uh, pretty much approximately 50% of our work group could be on Medicare now. So this is a big issue and people have a lot of questions around Medicare. When do I go on it? Um, how? What's the best time? And so this time of year is the time of the annual Medicare enrollment period. And we it runs between October 15th and December 7th every year. And we basically timed this presentation. This is our second time to do it, and it was pretty well received last year. So we're going to start doing it every year. But it, it, it's timely because we have it right before the annual Medicare enrollment period. We get a lot of questions from members and their spouses about what to do if they're still working and they turn 65 and become eligible for Medicare. So we've got someone here equipped to answer those questions for you. Yeah. I've got a question. Yes. If I have a question, how do I get that to you right now? There is a link on our website uh, that you're watching right now, the APFA question tracker. You just click on that link and you can submit your question. And we'll be answering some questions throughout the presentation and a lot more questions at the end of our presentation. Thank you. Uh, we get more questions from members who are getting ready to retire about what the process is. How do I I'm over 65 and I haven't signed up for Medicare. How do I avoid signing up without any late enrollment penalties? Guess what? Evan is going to address those questions for us as well. So uh, now moving right along to the rest of our presentation. Um, Patrick's going to talk about a little bit about our demographics. All right. I have a question for you. Now, this is as of September, like like live, almost numbers. How many of our members do you think are over the age of 80? Eight zero. Eight decades. Any yeah. guesses? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Guess. You're wrong. <laughs> it is 24. We have 24 flight attendants over the age of 80. And uh, that num those numbers, uh, if you start looking at the brackets by five years, we've got 169.75. We've got 569 or 70 to 74. 1,859 between 65 and 69, and every one of those people in that is eligible for Medicare today, but don't do it. Stick with your American Airlines plan. We'll talk about that. Uh, looking at 60 to 64, 4,317. Uh, 50 to 59, another 4,700. It's the largest age group. It may not be for long. Yeah, really, really. That They're pushing up at 60 to 64 is going to take over soon. That means we have 11,696 that are eligible to retire today. Um, yeah, and if it seems like APFA is spending a lot of time and resources on talking about retirement, Medicare, and all that stuff, that number is why. 
because such a large percentage of our workforce is eligible for that. Look at the rest of this round in the south, you know, some pretty big bulges there in the 40 plus, another 2,000 of the 35, 3,730, 30, 28. But look at this, man. We've got uh, yeah, five, six, seven, five, six, seven. Uh, 7,500 or so that are under the age of 30. So I think we have a pretty barbell shaped uh, seniority spectrum. Like we've got a bunch of senior people. Well, I'm going to call them old because I've discovered even though I'm, old, I'm not senior yet. <laughs> when does this ever happen? No, senior is an airline term. It's okay. not. Uh, okay, got it, got it. Yeah, <laughs> all right. So we've got we've got a bunch of uh, uh, older people and a bunch of younger people. So it's a, it's an interesting demographic, particularly when you run a democracy. So that's who we are. Let's talk about retirement. OK, so because this is our Medicare special edition, we're not going to go as in depth with our normal retirement presentation. Um, we do what we're going to call retirement in a nutshell. But if you want more in-depth information, we have all of our previous retirement seminars posted on the APFA website. At the, you go onto the website, you don't even have to log in. You click news on the top menu bar and then you see hotlines. Click on that. All of the most recent hotlines will come up and you can watch a multitude. You can watch five different retirement seminars if you really want to and hear all our same jokes over and over. <laughs> and over. Yeah. They um, get yeah. better with age. I'm just saying. <laughs> Patrick gets better. Um, so we also have another resource, which is the APFA retirement packet, and that is also on the retirement page of our website. You can download it. Um, I'll be happy to print it up and mail you a copy if you prefer. You can contact me at retirement at APFA.org or uh, give me a call at 817-540-0108 and my extension is 8490. So now let's talk about retirement in a nutshell. Here's the things you're going to need to think about if you're planning to retire. Um, first, there are some very important questions you need to have in your head if you're considering retirement. Are you ready to retire? And there's so many components to being ready to retire. What do you need to retire? Money, that's one thing I can think of, and Patrick's going to talk a lot about retirement income. What about income? Here we go. Crucial. And what about health benefits? That's, you know, the big three. If you're thinking about retirement, what am I going to do about income? What am I going to do about health care? And the very last thing you need to think about is how you're going to notify the company. But you got to get everything else into place. A lot of people think notification to the company is their first step, but really it's your last step. All right. So are you ready to retire? Um, we've got to talk about retirement eligibility because that's kind of the first component of knowing whether you're ready in terms of the benefits you're going to get when you retire. Um, the company's criteria for retirement eligibility is called the 65 point plan. And basically, in order to be eligible for the 65 point plan, you have to have 10 years of company seniority based on your date of hire. And your age plus your company seniority must equal 65 or more. So that's what gets you your retiree um, pass privileges. If you are if you leave the company and you're not eligible for the 65 point plan, if you have worked nine and a half years and you're 65 or older, guess what? You're not eligible and you don't want to leave yet because you wouldn't get the pass privileges. Um, it's also going to get you Anytime you leave the company, if you have vacation that you haven't used, you're going to be paid out for that vacation at the contractual rate, which is four hours per day at your rate of pay, as long as you have seven days or more vacation, um, 3.5 hours per day if you have six days or less of vacation. So basically, in, anytime you leave the company, whether you're eligible to retire or not, you will get paid out at the contractual rate for your vacation. But being eligible for the 65 point plan enables you to also be paid out for your sick time. It enables you to be uh, uh, eligible for a retirement gift, a fabulous retirement gift, and also for a retiree ID, which enables you to get your um, FedEx discount, travel discounts, uh, and so on. Anything that someone's going to offer our retirees um, as a 
as a retiree of an airline. So it's good to have all that. And if you're close um, or you're not sure about whether you're eligible for the 65 point plan, the best way to find out is to call the team member services number, which is 1 800 447 2000. And you follow the prompts for retirement questions and you'll get connected with a live person and say, hey, I just want to verify whether or not I'm eligible for the 65 point plan. And if I'm not yet eligible, when will I be eligible? And they can tell you the exact date. So that's good to do that. If you're not sure, you think you might be, you know, a day or a month off or something. Because you don't want to retire too soon. You want those benefits that you work for. All right. Patrick's going to talk a little bit about retirement readiness in terms of being mentally ready to retire. Yeah, um, we we talked to a lot of people who've already retired and, uh, you know, the company's found some new way to screw them and we figure that out. And then, well, before we're done, we say, OK, now I've got a question for you. Did you retire at the right time? Was it was it good? Did it work out? And like 98, 99 percent of them are like, oh, it was the best thing I ever do. I don't did. I don't know why I waited. I and my life is so full and busy. I don't know how I ever had time to go to work before. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk to that one or two percent that aren't happy. Why aren't they happy? And they're not happy almost universally because they didn't plan. Um, they uh, they said, oh, forty thousand dollars, man, that'll take the rest of me the rest of my life, and they're out the door. Or they took the sudden out. The sudden out? What is that? What's a sudden out? Well, that's where the union rep and the supervisor meet you on the jet bridge. Mm -hmm. And as you're walking up the jet bridge, the rep, the union rep says, I got your retirement. I recommend you take it. You really hadn't planned on leaving at this point, but you are. Or you're at the doctor's office and they say, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, you can't go back to work. Um, you didn't have a chance to plan. Those are the people that struggle with it. The good news for you is that you're on this seminar, you're planning, you're going to be in the group that's incredibly happy with it. Yay. So the question is, have you reached that point? And we're flight attendants. We'll talk to anybody about anything. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll ask our, you know, our neighbor, we'll ask that flight attendant on the jump seat that we've never seen before and we'll probably never see again. Um, and, and all of those people, because they want the best for you, will tell you what's right for them. That's how people work. They don't know what's right for you. You have to make that decision. And uh, I think the best uh, comparison I've ever heard was from a retired flight attendant. She says, you know, I, I, as I was leaving, literally walking out the door for the last time, I recognized the last time I had this queasy feeling. And that was when I decided to be a stewardess. Because back then I was a stewardess. And she said, I wasn't sure it was the right decision. But it felt right intellectually. It kind of felt right. It just wasn't. I just wasn't 100 percent sure. And because I'm retiring from that job, I, it probably was a pretty good idea. And she said that gave me comfort in that I, I called it right before that I'm probably calling it right now. So you have to ask the question. Are you ready? Hey, one of those things to being ready is you got to have enough money. Let's talk about money in retirement. You you will have multiple streams of income, and uh, so you're going to have your 401k, uh, you're going to have your IRA, you're going to have your Social Security. Yes, you'll have it. You're going to have savings, and savings has some weird things. The uh, weird looks more than just the dollars in the bank. It could be home equity. It could be, you know, a lot of different things out there. And if you have a pension, you'll have your pension as well. And whenever I look at that list, I think of it as like a five-legged stool. And a five-legged stool is really stable. And the best thing about a five-legged stool is that if one of those legs get kicked out from underneath you, you still have the other four. I mean, that doesn't mean it's not going to hurt. It doesn't mean it's not going to, you know, change your lifestyle. But you're going to have um, the some stability. And every time I look at that list, I am always so grateful that I work for, in a unionized workforce where my union has worked hard to make sure that I have all of those options available because I contrast that with the about 50 percent of Social Security recipients. That's all they have. And I do not know how you can use the word security in your in terms of your financial life when your entire financial life is dependent on the good graces of the United States Congress. Who we all know are sane, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about medical. 
Okay, so before we launch into the wide world of Medicare, we're going to talk a little bit about Medicare, I mean, medical insurance options for those of us who retire before we're eligible for Medicare. So a lot of people need to know that it's especially those people that end up having to retire before they intended to. So it's important to review the options. So uh, there's COBRA. Uh, COBRA is good because it's a way of continuing your current coverage, the exact coverage that you had as an active employee into retirement. Normally COBRA would last 18 months um, once it begins. And the bad thing about COBRA is it's expensive. Um, another good thing about COBRA is that you can pick and choose what you want to keep. So for instance, if you are eligible for Medicare, but you know, you're know you not seeing a lot of good dental options, you can elect to COBRA just your dental and not the medical. But if you're not eligible for Medicare yet, you can uh, elect to COBRA your medical, dental, and vision. So it, it has a degree of flexibility, which is nice. The cost factor, you are paying the full cost for COBRA plus a 2% admin fee. And I think this year for COBRA, for the sort of standard run-of-the-mill plan, um, here at AA, it is standard plan COBRA rates, employee only, $775.80. So that's just for one person. So that gives you an idea of how much COBRA is going to cost you. So that's why people look for other options. And here are some other options. Um, here's another option that is even more expensive, the AA Retiree Medical Insurance. Um, the people that are eligible for this medical coverage are those who are eligible for the 65-point plan when they retire, and they're between the ages of 50 and 55 and not yet eligible for Medicare. Um, so this uh, coverage is very costly, and it can change a lot from year to year because there aren't a lot of people in the plan and the coverage is based on whether they had a lot of high medical claims in the previous year. I've seen it go down a few times, but I'm pretty sure it's going up for 2024. And the cost for 2023 is already pretty exorbitant. It is for an employee only $2,171 a month. So obviously most people this is the hugest driver for people waiting to retire until they're eligible for Medicare because both COBRA and the retiring medical benefits are so costly. This was what we pre-funded for prior to the bankruptcy, but those days are gone. That ship has sailed, unfortunately. So if we want retiring medical, we have to pay. It sucks. <laughs> All right, so the Affordable Care Act. This is what most people do. Um, a lot of people choose COBRA, and then when that runs out, they're still not eligible for Medicare. They find something for, through the Affordable Care Act. And it can be, it's based on your income. So if you're a retiree and your income's gone down a bit, um, you could be eligible for subsidies, you know? So that's why we have the different dollar signs. The price can vary according to your income. Um, and then we have Medicare. So we're going to launch into that shortly, and Evan's going to give us a lot of good information. Um, but if you're over 65, Medicare is your option. You're not eligible for the AA retiree medical. You could keep your COBRA coverage, but guess what? COBRA is always secondary to Medicare. So if you sign up for COBRA thinking, oh, I'm 65, but I want to keep my coverage, guess what? It's going to pay as though you have Medicare, whether you sign up for not or not. And another thing about COBRA, it's not considered creditable coverage for Medicare. So if you sign up for COBRA and you're eligible for Medicare, thinking you're going to use that, and then six months later, after your special enrollment period has ended, you go, oh, or nine months later, whatever it is, I'm going to sign up for Medicare now. Guess what? You will be assessed late enrollment penalties. So basically, if you're 65 or older, or if you're eligible for Medicare due to a disability, Medicare is your option. Okay, so a few other options. Um, there's the old-fashioned way. 
You can marry someone with insurance, or if you're already married to someone who you're retiring and they work for another company and they have ins insurance through their health care provider, guess what? Your retirement is their life event to add you to their coverage. So you can go on somebody else's coverage. If you're married to another AA employee and you retire and they're still working, you can go on their coverage. However, remember if you're an AA employee and you retire, you go on your spouse's coverage, it's not going to be a continuation of your old coverage like COBRA. It's going to be like you're starting over with deductibles and so on. So keep that in mind. I would add one thing to that too. Possibly, especially if they retire, they may be eligible for Medicaid. So you, um, in some states, Medicaid does not count resources, assets, or your 401k. In some states, it's just income. Right. So if you've lost your job or retired, um, you can just Google Medicaid and your state and find out what the income limits are. Right. So if you're having to retire because of an illness or injury or abruptly before you had enough time to contribute to your 401k as much as you wanted to, you don't have the resources that you planned on having, Medicaid could be an option for you. And sometimes they have what's called special assistance mm -hmm. for Medicare as well, right? Right. And, and Medicare savings those programs are something you can check into. All right, another option is you can die young, but we don't want to do that. So the reason we're having this presentation, we want to give you your options. You're going to live long and prosper and avoid that one. So I thought right. I like a good die. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we're stretching that. Oh, okay, okay. okay, so Med Medicare initial enrollment period is when you turn 65 and uh, Evan's going to talk to us about what you have to know about the Medicare initial enrollment period. Okay, well, thank you, Kim. Thank you for having me here. We're glad to have you here Thanks. because she's the expert and we are not. And I would also just reiterate that I um, am an, an independent agent. I do not work for Medicare. I don't work for the government, but um, just to you know, give you that full disclosure. So Medicare in initial enrollment period, um, it is considered the normal time to enroll at age 65. And that period starts three months before your birth month, includes your birth month, and three months after. You can sign up anytime during that time period. If you're signing up for Part A only, you can sign up after that as well, and it would start up the next month. Okay, so we get a lot of questions about the three months before, the three months after. Mm -hmm. So if I'm signing up three months before, or I'm really early, and that's my Medicare enrollment period, does that mean my Medicare is going to start three months before? No, it will start on your birth month. It always starts on the first day of the month. So if your birth, say your birthday is April 2nd, your Medicare will start April 1st. Um, the one exception is if your birthday does happen to fall on the first of the month. So if that same birth month of my birthday was April 1st, then my Medicare would start one month prior, March 1st. So the only time you can start before the first of the month of your birthday month is if your birthday is actually on the first. Right. Okay. Right. Good to know for those people that are born on the first of the month, April Fool's babies and things like that. Right. Oh, that's true. And it does come up, obviously. Okay. So you know a little bit about the Medicare initial enrollment period, age 65, but... What if I plan to continue working past age 65? What do I need to know then? Okay, then um, if you want to work past age 65, you don't have to enroll in Medicare at all if you choose not to. I would recommend still enrolling in Medicare at age 65 on for Part A, which is free. A um, couple different reasons. It may not even kick into the benefit to you if you're staying on the American insurance. But it does just get you started. Say there's some kind of glitch. Sometimes um, Social Security could have a birthday wrong or a middle initial and a, you know, a middle name wrong, something to where there's a hang up. It just gets that all settled. So I do recommend go ahead and enroll in Part A um, when you can, when you turn 65. And the exception to that would be if you are enrolled in a healthcare savings account. Isn't yeah. that the one attached to the, uh, I call it the new hire plan, the low cost, the, the, core, low, plan. Low, the core plan? The that's core plan. It's yeah. not yeah. a deductible plan. It's the plan that if you don't, when you first get hired, opt into a plan, they sign you up for the core plan. So that's what we call it. the oh, new hire plan. Okay. But it's the high deductible plan. Most people don't uh, 
consciously choose that unless they want the account for Medicare. That's the main benefit of it. But you can't contribute to that account if you're also enrolled in Medicare, which includes Medicare Part A. So that's the one time. That is the one time, and it is important because it's, it can be a bit of a mess to undo it. Um, so yes, if you choose to contribute to a healthcare savings account, you don't want to enroll in any part of Medicare, including Part A. And as I said, Part A rarely kicks in, which is just hospital coverage. Um, normally your AA plan would cover that. So if you're an HSA believer, which I am, I happen to really like the idea of contributing to an HSA, then no, wor no worries, you, you won't have a late enrollment penalty. Okay, so um, did we discuss any, did we discuss? Oh, if you are married, let's see, if you're married and covered under your spouse's employee when you turn 65, then check the rule for their health plan. And that is true. Um, you need to ensure that uh, that employer has over 20 employees and therefore would be considered credible. So some employer plans require covered individuals to sign up for Medicare when you turn 65, even if you're working. Not shocking. Yeah, no, we, we don't want AA to get that idea ever. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. Okay, so we've covered working past 65. You guys submit your questions if you have more questions about that because that's a huge one we get all the time. You know, everybody and their dog is telling me I have to sign up for Medicare when I turn 65 or I'll be penalized. Yeah, I so all the time. guess what you don't? Our expert just told us that you don't. So what happens? When I retire and I didn't sign up at age 65, how do I avoid those special enrollment penalties? So uh, when you retire after, six, after age 65, you are entitled to a Medicare special enrollment period, an SEP as it's called. You have eight whole months. You wouldn't want to go that long because you don't want to go that long without insurance, but you do have that much time from the date your employment ends to sign up for Medicare. Keep in mind that to prevent uh, a late enrollment penalty, you must enroll in Part A and B and provide proof of credible coverage within 60 days. So there are special forms for that. Um, what what uh, an agent can help you do is kind of walk you through that, but you would end up sending a form. It's called the L564 form to American Airlines or the company where you have your insurance that simply verifies that yes, you've had coverage, credible coverage um, all this time. And what they're doing is they're just telling Social Security, don't, don't assess a late enrollment penalty for this person because they've had credible coverage. Okay, so the form is available on the Social Security website, which is the best way to get it. Yes, you can just type in L564. You can type in uh, request for employment information. That would get in the search box. And the reason that's the best way to get it is they don't update it every year. Sometimes it's two years, but you, you could always be sure you're going to get the latest version of the form. I haven't seen it change a lot, but the dates on the bottom change occasionally. So, right. And right. it's also available on JetNet. Um, I can't tell you exactly where because the company kind of stashes it away um, there. They have a link to it. It might be in their little seven step retirement guide somewhere. Um, also, we'll, ha we'll be happy to email you a copy or mail you a copy if you're um, email challenge. So um, we send those out all the time to people. Let us know if you need a copy. Uh, all right, so moving right along from the special enrollment period, here's a little picture of what the form looks like. Everybody wants to know, and it's really easy. The only part you have to fill out is the tiny part A at the top. Part B, anything below the line is filled out by your employer, American Airlines. It's like my family leave form. It's I fill out the top, then we'll fill out the bottom. Kind of similar and not as complicated. <laughs> it'll, it'll take you 10 seconds to fill that form. Really out. easy. And the best thing to do to get this form done quickly and get it back to you, because guess what? The company, um, you they get it from you. The best way to get it to them is to fax it to them. And you fax it to the Alight fax number. And that fax number is, give me a second. It looks like a Chicago area code. So the Alight fax number is 847-554-1884. That's the fax for the Benefit Service Center. So if you fax 
that form in, fill out the top portion, fax it into the company, and then they will snail mail it. After they finish their portion, they're going to snail mail it back to you. Um, and if it's both you and your spouse uh, covered under AA, you'll fill out one for yourself and one for your spouse. Yes, it's very important because I talked to quite a few people that send one in for them and don't realize they needed one for their spouse as well. So good point. Thank you. Um, so and really, they're kind of slow at doing that. So I recommend doing that. Our last Medicare expert recommended doing it 90 days out. So anywhere between 60 and 90 days out, if, if you can do it. Um, they do do a 60 day look back. So that's why I say 60 days, but they're so slow at filling it out. So right. by the time they send it back, it probably would have been 60 days for the look back anyway. But that's good to know. So 60 days out, 90 days out, but no further out than that. And I recommend that when you get that form back, have that form in your hand at the same time as you have the application for Part B form in your hand, and you'll fax those together to Social Security. Mm -hmm. Social Security. And, and we will also send you the Medicare Part B application as well. If you want that, you don't send that one into the company. <laughs> Kim, I've got a question for you. Yes. I noticed you referred to this and there was that thought, that uh, fax number right there. What are you referring to there? What is that? Once again, I'm referring to the APFA Retirement Packet Good Slide, a very valuable resource. It's available on the APFA website. I'll mail it to you. I'll email it to you. Get it. It will help you with your retirement checklists, um, contacts. It's all there. Well, very good. All right, so Medicare alphabet soup, we like to call it. Mm -hmm. Medicare seems so confusing and very intimidating when you're signing up. So this is because unlike your employer coverage, where everything's covered under one umbrella pretty much, um, under Medicare, they have to make it complicated and divide it out. It's part A, part B, part D, supplement plans, advantage plans. What does it all mean? It's so confusing. That's why we have an expert. <laughs> so, no. Evan, let's start with Medicare Part A and explain what, what that's all about. Okay. So, it's it's not as hard as it, it sounds. I mean, there are a lot of moving parts to Medicare, but once you kind of get the general idea, it's not too bad. So, Medicare Part A, just in a big picture kind of way, if you just remember, it's hospital coverage, inpatient hospital coverage. So, that would cover the inpatient here in the hospital skilled nursing care facility, nursing home care, that would be for short stays only, inpatient care in a skilled nursing home facility, that's not long term, hospice care, home health care, and there's no cost for most people who have Part A. As long as you've contributed uh, to the Medicare fund for 10 years, then there is no charge for Part A. And then call it something else, so many quarters 10 years or 40 quarters 40 quarters, 40 quarters. yeah so, people, so if they say that it means more or less the same thing right. and if you for some reason did not work that long you can still get part a you would just have to pay for it how many do we know percentage wise how many people have to um, not very many not right? very many okay. right. it's fractional i mean it's it's like a, a tenth of a percent so it's unlikely that you'll have to pay for part a if you've been working for american airline right <laughs> Unless you took a lot of leaves back in the day. Oh, yeah, that's possible. <laughs> and now with the hard 40, almost nobody's going to fall into that category. Right. All right. So, so then we would go to Part B. Let's go to Part B. So Part B is where you're going to have most of your Medicare costs, your medical costs throughout your life. Um, it would cover medically necessary services that are related to diagnosis to treat your medical conditions, uh, preventative preventative services, and those do change with Medicare. Um, Patrick's got the Medicare and You book. It's a good idea to look at that and see what's all covered for preventative services. The durations, the intervals are a little bit shorter on Medicare. Let's see, um, yeah, the screening. Part B covers things like clinical research, ambulance services, durable medical equipment, mental, mental health, inpatient, outpatient, and limited outpatient prescription drugs. That would just be basically injections that you receive at the doctor's office. So that's Medicare Part A and B. Where you'll see this later, it doesn't mean quite so much probably to you right now, but if you choose to stay on Medicare, and this will 
delve into this later versus Medicare Advantage. But if you choose to stay on Medicare, you'll be receiving Medicare summary notices when you have services, when you um, see the doctor or have a surgery. And then you'll see everything broken down on those summaries for medi what so Medicare. So regular Medicare versus an advantage. Model. Versus an advantage. So summary notices, are they like your explanation? Of they're it? exactly like that. They're the EOBs. So it's called Medicare summary notice. You don't receive it if you don't have any service, but once you get some type of service, then you would see those regularly. And it's just a way for you to check that no one's using your Medicare card and, and kind of, um, you know, just an overview. You can also make sure that nothing was denied. Uh, so you'll be seeing part A and part B throughout your life once you retire on those forms. Okay, Patrick, do you have any? Questions about Part B or any concerns that you've heard from members? Um, I had somebody ask me a question a while back. They said that uh, for some reason that they were paying a much higher rate than someone yeah, else so for. That's Irma. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> With that Irma coming out. Oh, Irma's Irma's coming out. Coming okay. out. Yeah, that's Irma. She's not everyone's we're not favorite. Her, <laughs> but I think first we're going to explain Part D and then we'll go into the dreaded Irma. Okay, very good. So Part D is a little different. This is your prescription drug coverage. And again, we'll delve into Medicare Advantage in a bit. Um, Medicare Advantage might include Part D. But anyway, um, it's something you get from a private plan either way. Uh, it's part of Medicare that covers most outpatient prescription drug coverage. It's offered through private companies, whether you stay in original Medicare or go with Medicare Advantage. And it sometimes, as I said, is included with Medicare Advantage plans. And Part D, it's a good way of remembering D for drugs. That's so right. If you're confused about all the different moving pieces here, always remember D for drugs. There you go. And um, a lot of people, I mean, this is the main reason Part D covers your benefits. What is the donut hole and does that still exist? Uh, it does still exist. <laughs> the coverage gap, it's sometimes called, sometimes it's called the donut People hole. People ask about that and they're concerned about that. Yeah. And they always hear things be. <laughs> talking about closing the donut hole. Oh, so right. What well, does that mean? Okay, and related to that, I'm going to backpedal just a little bit about Part D because sometimes people consider leaving the employer plan for different reasons. And sometimes there is a reason to do it and to go on Medicare. but as long as we're on that topic, Part D, prescription drug, um, that usually can get more expensive on Medicare versus employer group. So I never want anyone to be caught off guard with that, to you know just make the switch to Medicare for some reason and not consider their own prescription drugs. So I would just, um, my advice would be if you are considering, I know I'm going off topic a bit, but if you are considering leaving the employee plan and going on to Medicare before you before you retire, to make sure you price out your your medications on Medicare, um, an agent can help you do that, or you can get on Medicare.gov and price them out that way. But especially specialty uh, medications, and if you're on a specialty drug, you probably know it because it's quite a bit more expensive than just say like a high blood pressure pill or something like that. But if you're on specialty meds, um, unfortunately, they can get expensive. You hear in the news all the time. They can get expensive on Medicare. So coming back to your question, though, about the coverage gap. So what the coverage gap is, it's once you, the person who has a Part D plan and Medicare together, have spent $4,600 on your medication, you move into a different phase. It's complicated. I know it's crazy. It's complicated. Um, Only a government. Yeah, I know. It's kind of crazy. Set it up this way. So there's actually four phases in the drug plan. I'll just say this quickly because it's really diving deep. But you have a deductible phase where you pay all of your med costs. And we're kind of used to that deductible mm -hmm. phase. That's pretty normal. You have your initial coverage phase, which is also called the copay phase. We're kind of used to that too. And so you go in, I pay cost sharing, basically. Cost sharing, I pay 20 bucks, and maybe the my prescription drug plan pays 80 bucks somewhere. Who knows what? That's the uh it's usually 80, 20 years. Yeah, right. somewhere in there, and it's reasonable. Except for certain medications and they think you right, <laughs> and it can be higher, and there's reasons for that too. But after those two phases, so you have the deductible, initial coverage, and then is the coverage gap. 
So again, that is once you and the drug company together have spent $4,600, and that's for 2023, then you move to a higher cost share. You pay 25% of the cost of the drug, which is usually higher. It actually, in some instances, could be lower, but most of the time it's higher. So that lasts until you, you and the drug company have reached $7,000. So that's the gap. I mean, it's... So it's, your, it's confusing. Your that's portion, your portion, and it suddenly becomes higher. Right. Okay. So it's not like you're paying 100 percent again. It's like not like you're paying a whole thing. Right. But it's you know it, it can be a lot. Right. And then I reach the end of that third phase, and I've now we've both spent more than the seven thousand. Right. Uh, am I back to an 80-20 point? No. Then you go into what's called the catastrophic phase. Then it then your share drops to five percent. <laughs> Yeah, I know. But we don't ever want to be in a catastrophic phase. No, you don't. I mean, it sounds so negative, but the good part about it is you do pay less. So that's part of the process when you decide to enroll in Medicare is really work to the prescription drug piece. It's It can be the driver on which, uh, which plan you choose, which route you go, because it can you know, obviously be very expensive. And, and you want to dive deep at that point into understanding those phases. And you also want to create your own online account so you can monitor it. Um, and another thing about Medicare Part D, uh, I've talked to a few people recently because our, our health costs at American Airlines are increasing. You mm -hmm. know? And if you're eligible for Medicare, some people are like, I'm just going to go on Medicare. Well, one thing to think about is the drugs because Definitely. I've talked to quite a few people that have gone on Medicare in lieu of the company's um, benefits, and some are happy with it, and it seems overall to them to be a little bit less expensive. But if you're on a lot of expensive drugs and specialty medications, um, I've had several people decide that they're going to pause Medicare and go back on the company's insurance. Right. And once you elect Medicare, for your primary coverage, the company is going to drop you from their coverage. You can go back to their coverage, but it's going to take a little bit of doing and pausing Medicare is going to take a little bit of doing. Right. So that's why you need to talk to somebody like Evan and any drug uh, and any Medicare advisor worth their salt is going to say, let's look at what you have now in terms of drug coverage versus what you could get with Medicare Part D. And that's going to drive your decision about whether to sign up for Medicare while you're still working. Sure. If they don't want to do that driver. with you, find another advisor because the good ones will be willing to go through that. Uh, absolutely. And your basic, um, like I said, blood pressure medications, that type of thing, thyroid meds, those are usually fairly inexpensive. Those aren't the issue. But if you're on specialty meds, absolutely spend a lot of time checking into the prescription drug mm -hmm. piece. And we had a question come in on, on Part D, and that is, I'm told that uh, my costs can vary for the same drugs between different providers. How do I tell which provider to go with? So which insurance plan? Yeah. That's where you can either work with an agent or you yourself can log on to Medicare.gov, scroll down to I'm um, comparing plans. Then you can uh, look at either Medicare Advantage that includes drug prices or you can look at a standalone plan and maybe check them both out. Um, just there's there's definitely uh, a difference between the different plans. Um, each plan has their own what's called a formulary. That is, here's the drugs that we cover, here's how they're priced, and you can get that information online and, and you'll even have a month by month breakdown of what that drug will cost you. That sounds very cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And another question I've been getting, well, a concern from people, and it's when they sign up for Part D, a lot of certain agents will steer them towards the least expensive Medicare Part D. And a lot of people will say, hey, I'm going to sign up for that because I'm really healthy. I don't have any issues. I'm not really on any medications. But then a year or two later, something happens and they need to be on an expensive medication. Mm -hmm. And it's either not covered or really expensive on that Part D, they can change, right? At they, annual enrollment. At so annual enrollment. Right. Okay, so if there's a process for changing, but can they ask health questions if they change Part D? Uh, no, for Part D, okay. there are no health questions. So uh, they would have to wait till the annual enrollment. They would have to wait for annual enrollment. Uh, there are 
certain situations where there's a special enrollment period, just like if you were to retire, you know, you retire in, in June, you don't have to wait for that annual enrollment in the fall. You can get right on Medicare. So that's one special enrollment period. There's a few others. If you move out of state to a different state, then you can join it basically at any time. Um, but yes, I mean, again, you just really want to be careful about enrolling in a plan. Um, an agent or again, looking on Medicare.gov, it would direct you. I mean, it has all the medications loaded into the software, so you will have the opportunity to actually type in your medication, the dosage, exactly what you take, how often, and it will price out and give you not only here's the cheapest plan for you, but also it will it will show you even at what point you would enter the coverage gap and what you would pay at that point. OK, so if I were signing up for Medicare and this is just because I'm really healthy, I'm not on any medication at all, you know, a few supplements, but nothing prescribed by the doctor. But I would, in researching my Part D, think maybe because usually the time you use your insurance coverage, it's in the last years of your life. Maybe I will look at the formulary list for what a lot of people get, you know, as they get older, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, this and that, mm -hmm. and say, make sure these basic medications that a lot of people end up using before, you know, the end of their life are covered by that. Medicare Part D plan mm -hmm. and not sign up with a super basic one just because it's really cheap. And that's just me. I'm cautious. So <laughs> um, you might want to consider that and look at, um, especially if the next plan maybe is just a couple dollars more. Mm -hmm. um, Medicare is required. They are not required to, a, a Medicare drug plan rather, is not required to offer every drug out there, but they are required to cover two drugs in each category and they are categorized um, according to Medicare. So I think you if, if you price them out and you look at your your meds, you actually can feel comfortable going with one of the lower price okay. plans, knowing that they are required to carry a medication in each each category. Okay. But if you know that you've tried certain medications in a, in a category and you can only take the you know right the brand name or whatever you might right. be able to, you might need to do a little bit more research right okay good that's helpful for people to know all right anything else about medicare part d i think we're good well let's go on to the dreaded irma oh there she is who or what <laughs> is irma and what do we need to know about it or her or whatever <laughs> explain irma well people do this is another uh topic that delves into going off of the employer group plan early, that sometimes this can be, you know, kind of bite you when you aren't expecting it. So IRMA stands for the Income Related Monthly Adjustment Amount. So what <laughs> That's you, an awful it is, it's basically what you're going to pay for Part B depends on your income. So IRMA is an amount you pay in addition to your Part B or and or Part D premium if your income is above a certain level. So right now, if your income is above 97,000 a year, you would be paying uh, an adjusted amount that would be higher. And that's projected to go up to 102,000 a year. So if you'll just kind of remember 100,000, if you earn over 100,000 a year, you will be um, paying a higher amount for your Part B premium. Um, and again, um, it's based on your IRS tax return, Medicare and the IRS do communicate. So they look two years prior to determine your Part B amount. So if it's 2023, they're looking at your 2021 income. So I bring that up, you know, talking about people considering going off of the employer group plan. You know, if you think you're going to be selling, say, for an example, an investment property next year, well, that's going to drive up your income. If that was an investment property, it's it's based on modified adjusted gross income. So you would want to factor that in. A lot of people stay on employer group plan for that reason. They're high paid or maybe their spouse is on their plan and their spouse um, is a high income earner. Then you would want to stay on employer group plan mm -hmm. and avoid sense. that. OK, so say I it's based on a two year look back. Right. So say I'm going to retire this year and I've kind of been preparing for that. I've been flying the hard 40 this year. I'm going to retire at the end of the year. But I get my Medicare premium because it's two year look back, it's still high. Okay. 
there is an appeal process, right? There is. Um, definitely, I, I say pretty much every time, if you do get a letter that says you're gonna, going to be paying an IRMA charge, there is a very easy way to appeal it. The form is not difficult. You can, again, just Google that IRMA appeal. And that's on Medicare.gov? Right. Okay. Um, Medicare.gov, and you can even find it, you know, just Googling it. But um, sending an appeal, I wouldn't count on this forever, though, because, you know, Medicare with the high number of people, the retiree, the age group, the demographics, Medicare is going to need money. <laughs> it's just the way it is. So currently, um, if your income was reduced because you uh, retired, they that appeal would go through. They would say, OK, you're not a high income earner. You, you've retired. So we'll, we'll take that away. You can pay standard IRMA. But, um, you know, so there's been some rumors. I haven't even heard, necessarily heard murmurings, but there's a lot of murmurings about what is Medicare going to do to make money. Right. So I would just, you know, be careful about that. I right. would count on it. They're already making up with those, by the, you know, the RV premium. Yep. Yeah. The, the <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. All right. So let's look at a little chart. She was talking about the income levels that, you know, make you uh, mm -hmm. have to pay Irma. Yeah, there it is. Pay up. So this is just a little chart. So this is the last year's number. And actually, this time last year, um, we were sitting here and we were going, the, those numbers always go up every year. They actually, it was 170. It was 170, 10, if I remember right. Uh, 2022, and then in 2023, it actually went down a little bit. But uh, uh, Things that we've been hearing is are that for 2024 it will go up again to what 175 or 180. Right, 174 or something like that. 74 right? 90. That's mm -hmm. what they're saying now, but we won't know until it's out and official from uh, Medicare. Right, and you can see. I mean, that's a some of those numbers are high monthly amount. If you make Looking back again, two years between 153 to 183, $428.60 a month. And that will, it will come out of your Social Security if you're receiving Social Security, or if you're not, you'll receive a quarterly bill for it in the mail. Yes, Patrick and I last year were getting a little bit of a fiendish pleasure from the fact that does Doug Parker, when he retired, was going to oh, have true. to pay <laughs> higher than we would when we retired, yeah. you know, so. Um, there is one small consolation of being a lower wage earner. Right. Although we're trying to get that fixed in negotiations. We don't want to be quite as low of wage earners as we are right now. And so. this is this is getting into the financial planning a little bit. But if you have a financial planner and they're um, working with you on Roth conversions or, you know, again, I said selling investment property, all that needs to be considered and maybe um, doled out small doses because if you say, for example, if you did a Roth conversion in one year and sold an investment property, your your Irma could skyrocket. So it's just um, something just to have in the back of your mind in your investment plan. I think the phrase is timing is everything. Timing, so timing is timing very important. Income. But any financial planner is going to be factoring that in. So if you're considering retiring, you know, two years out, one year out, uh, if you're not seeing a financial planner, it's a great time to do it. And Patrick, talk about the American Airlines Credit Union flagship financial group. That's a really good resource for a lot of people yeah. at American yeah. Airlines because more than 50%, what percentage have our credit union accounts at AA? Uh, AA employees, mm -hmm. it's north of 80%. North of 80%, so that access um, to a free resource. Uh, exactly, and the American Airlines Credit Union uh, has a department called the Flagship Financial, and they will provide uh, free financial planning for you. Uh, if you're not a member, you can go in and get the, the same support, uh, except it, it costs you, uh, I think the re last report I got, the, the non-member price was $1,700, but because I was a member, it was free. So I, mean, I like that free word, but they, uh, they, the great thing about the flagship financial people that I like is that they are all American Airlines employees as well. So they are intimately familiar with our 401k and, and all of our uh, premiums because that's theirs as well. Yeah, very good. And their fiduciaries. And their fiduciaries. And, which uh, means? Which means that they are, they are legally required to put your interests ahead of theirs. 
And uh, the other thing that I like about the flagship financial people is that they're salaried. Their, their income does not go up if they put you in product B or go down if they put you in product C. So they're, 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 they don't have any conflicting motivations other than to help you select the, the right products. Good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if, if you're not a member of the credit union, you're in that like 20% that isn't a member, you can join for five bucks. It's the best $5 you'll ever spend. Nice. Just you can get the, the support from them. That is a great tip. Mm -hmm. You know, on this topic, this is this is kind of opposite of Irma, really. But as long as we're talking about Part B premiums, also when you retire, um, just be aware that there is help for paying for Medicare premiums if you're low income. So um, it varies by state. So I won't go into details here, but you can just uh, yeah, Google Medi maybe not so much. Yeah, <laughs> Medicare savings programs is what they're called. So you can Google that for your state and just see what that's about. It'll give you the income levels, but only half of the people who are eligible actually apply, which is such a shame. That is because a shame. Part B premiums are, are spendy. So, um, you know, maybe maybe you would qualify for some of those possibly. At the, at the risk of confusing things here, is that the what some people call the extra help? So extra help is another um, option to consider. Um, there's Medicare savings programs that helps with Part B premiums. And there's different levels of assistance based on your income and resources. And then there's extra health. So I might as well talk about that. Mm -hmm. So extra health, you can Google extra health or you can Google LIS for low income subsidy. Um, that is not a state program. That's a federal program. So it's going to be the same for everyone. Um, the, the new levels for LIS are going to be announced really soon, I, I, probably this week for 2024. But there's there's diff, there's four different levels um, based on your income. Now, a lot of people do not apply, do not qualify rather for this because on this program, resources do count. Um, the most you can have, it's right around 18,000. I can look it up, but it's right around 18,000. So if you have uh, a 401k with more than $18,000, you would not qualify for the LIS program. But it is something to keep in mind. And again, not as many, nearly as many people get it as are qualified for it. So if it's not for you, perhaps your parents would qualify. That is all centered on prescription drug though. Okay. It's not for assistance with Medicare premiums. It's, it's strictly about getting a uh, reduced price for prescription drugs. So these are two good resources and I'm learning something and we're going to have to add a little bit about this to our presentation. No, it, the it's future. great to know for just anyone in your world who especially is paying those really high dollars for specialty drugs, they could be getting them at a greatly reduced price if they qualify. Very good to know. Talk to your Medicare advisor. They, if they're a good one, they're going to help you with this step too. Hopefully they <laughs> should. <laughs> they should. All right, so we've discussed IRMA. Now we're going to discuss Medicare supplement plans or Medigap. So, okay. So, I'm, I was just telling Kim before we started is um, often it's it can be confusing Medicare supplement and, and Medicare Advantage. They are two different things. They're not the same thing. So uh, Medicare supplement helps with original Medicare, and that's for people who choose to stay on original Medicare. Uh, Medicare does not pay for all the costs for covered health care services and supplies. Medicare supplement insurance, also called Medigap, are sold by private insurance companies, and they can help pay some of the remaining costs for covered services and supplies, co-payments, co-insurance, and deductible. Um, the, the price point that comes up most commonly of concern is the 20% that Medicare does not pay. So for Part B, there is a 20% um, gap where Medicare does not cover it, and there is no out-of-pocket maximum. Wait, wait, wait. I think I can do the math on that. So if I go into the hospital and have a million dollars of Part I'm B just expenses, say a I'm going to have to be responsible for that 200,000, 20%. If you stay on original Medicare only, so that's the red, white, and blue card you get from the government. 
it's good coverage. Um, it's it's not that it's bad to be on Medicare because with Medicare, you can see any doctor. There's a lot of great things about Medicare, but you want to pair it up with, with a supplement. supplement to cover that gap. Okay. To cover the gap. Got it. Right. So our grandparents or great grandparents may have been on Medicare original without a supplement, but there's great um, financial exposure with that. So you do want to pair it up with a supplement if you choose to go that route. Okay, and then there are how many different there's Medigap a, plans? There's quite a few and they're lettered, which I wish they weren't lettered mm -hmm. because then you get all complicated with part A, B, C, and D. Um, the most common plan, the most popular plan right now, I'll just stick with that, is plan G. So the way that works with a supplement, I mean, with, uh, it is a supplement, the way it works with Medicare is it covers everything Medicare doesn't cover. So as long as it's medically necessary, so you can't go like get cosmetic surgery with it, has to be medically necessary and covered by Medicare, then your supplement would kick in and cover everything that Medicare does not cover. Now with Plan G, which is the most comprehensive, it's you know I heard Phil refer to it as a Cadillac of plans, and that's a good way to look at it. It's a it's a great plan of very strong coverage. There is one little teeny tiny deductible, and that's two hundred and twenty six dollars a year. That's your Part B deductible. But other than that, you'd be covered, and you can see any doctor or go to any hospital who accepts Medicare. Is that oh. a plan that anyone can get, or is that one of the ones that is only available to people who were born before a certain year? No, that that plan anyone can get. Okay. Yeah. But on that topic, everything has to go off into a bunny trail. But on that topic, <laughs> See, like bunny trail. with Medicare supplement, you have what's called an open enrollment period. It's basically a guaranteed issue period, and that is the first six months that you have Part B. So the first six months that you have Part B, which for a lot of people, let's say 65, but people who retire later, it would be later than that. You can buy a supplement without any medical questions, without any medical underwriting, as they call it. So it's a great time to buy a Medicare supplement. Later, if it's say seven months after you've had Part B, then you would go through what's called medical underwriting, similar to what if you buy life insurance. So in other words, the insurance company wants to decide if they want to insure you. So it's uh, important to get it early on if you decide to go that route. And that's why we say at the bottom, consult a Medicare advisor like Evan and download Medicare in you. Or if you're over 65, they should start sending it to you every year. Don't throw that book out. Don't throw the book <laughs> out. It's going to come. And if you're planning on getting on Medicare anytime in the near future, or even thinking about your retirement planning for the next couple of years, because the basics of it don't change that much. It's a very, very useful resource. And on page 76 of this book, it talks about all the different Medigap plans, which are also known as Medicare supplement plans. So it's a great resource, and I keep a copy at my desk, um, Patrick does too, so yeah. if, you, if you get it in the mail, keep it. It will be useful. Honestly, you can read it. It might sound boring, but you can read it cover to cover, and you'll earn you'll learn quite a bit. It's you know, it doesn't sound like the most ideal reading, but honestly, you'll learn quite a bit. It'll answer any questions you have. Okay, I've got a question. I I, I read through it, and it looks like part of a uh, uh, G plan is the one that I want to do. Um, but I live in a big metroplex. There's more than one company that will sell me a part gene supplement, do I have to compare the benefits to compare Blue Cross G to Aetna G or? You don't have to compare the benefits because unlike Medicare Advantage, and we'll talk about that in a bit, but unlike Medicare Advantage, Medicare supplement is standardized. So the government says to these insurance companies, and it can even be like an auto insurance company, some of them offer a supplement. Um, you can assure these people, but your plan has to be standard. So let's say a standardized plan, you could buy one plan from one company, you could look at the next company and their benefit is going to be exactly the same. So yes, you'll get quotes and they can quote differently. And sometimes it's even $20 a month or so different in price. So I mean, it's definitely worth some research. They can offer some benefits, some added benefits such as gym membership, only a couple gyms, a couple insurance companies offer that. But uh, there's a few discounts, uh, added benefits, minor changes, but the core product, the meta 
medical side of it is the same for all of them. So I'm comparing apples to apples, really, and I just can just look at price and any any sweeteners they put in there. Right, but I would be careful not to look at just price because it, when serious things happen, say for example, COVID, um, you want to, in my opinion, go with a company that has a lot of um, people in the pool. So the Joe H up, uh, right. or G plant up here may not be as solid you as know, the new people products. in the market that are forty dollars under a month. You know, forty dollars a month less than right. they, one of the large insurance companies. I would just be careful of that. And so, the one thing I tell people when they're going, well, what do I sign up for? How do I talk to your doctor? If you want to keep your doctor. Find out what Medicare plans they accept. If, if your doctor's in that network, if all of your doctors are in that network, that's going to work for you. You know, so if you find out, I'm going to go on UHC because I've had UHC for years and I like them, but the Medicare supplement plan UHC might be slightly different. That might not be the right reason to do it. Just make sure, start with talking to your doctors that's and your friends and family that are already on Medicare. I do, yeah, I think that's a great idea. People you know and trust that have the choice, and again, we haven't really talked that much about Medicare Advantage yet, but it's one of your biggest decisions is, do I want to go the Medicare Advantage route or do I want to stick with original Medicare and go the supplement route? advantage or supplement. They're not the same thing. <laughs> They're not the same thing. So let's so, continue because yeah. our next slide, what's the advantage of Medicare Advantage plans? What are they? How are they different from supplement? Plans? Okay, very good. So this is Medicare Advantage is often uh, called or is called Part C. Um, it's a Medicare approved plan from a private insurance company that offers an alternative to original Medicare for your health and drug coverage. They're bundled plans, so it includes um, Part A, Part B, and usually prescription drug. In most cases, you can only use doctors who are in the plans network. So that's what Kim was just talking about. And that's the biggest difference right there uh, between Medicare Advantage and Medicare Supplement. So I'll repeat it. <laughs> in most cases, you can only use doctors who are in the plans network. So if you're talking things we're familiar with, it's a little bit more similar to an HMO in structure? Not totally. Okay, there is HMOs and there are P PPOs, but on that topic, Medicare Advantage is where we pretty used to all the language of Medicare Advantage. It's very similar to what we have in employer group plans. So you have co-pays, you have deductible to look at when you're comparing plans. You have a maximum out of pocket cost to look at when comparing plans. And you have doctors, hospitals, durable medical equipment, so on and so forth, who are in network. And then there are some who are out of network. So that is like our company plan because we have to be in the network, even though we're a PPO. And most of our the company tries to get us a good network with lots of doctors, or so mm -hmm. they say. But if you go out of network, what you're allowed to do, it's a whole separate deductible and it's much higher. Well, if there are within the uh, Medicare Advantage umbrella, <clears throat> there are PPOs, um, preferred provider organization and health maintenance maintenance organizations. There are HMOs. So we're, you know, we're kind of used to that, maybe an HMO, um, maybe a PPO. But um, if you're in an HMO, then you, you have to stay at network. And if you're in a PPO, often you can go out of network for a higher cost. And the reason we have this picture is because one of the perks and advantage plans kind of try and reel you in by offering you a lot of perks. And sometimes they're great. And one of them they often offer is gym memberships or silver sneaker memberships. So, right. right. Um, um, <clears throat> we talked about kind of the cost share on the supplement plans. What about an advantage plan? Everybody gets thrilled about the advantage plans because they don't have to pay any premiums and they don't uh, most of the time they don't have to pay anything in addition for the part d because the advantage plan often includes the part d right so they're just playing for their part b and everything else is covered under the advantage plan if they sign up and some of them will even subsidize your part d too they want you to sign up for it so badly right so yes. because they make money if they do a, a I, where's your cost share coming in? you're wondering that because if most of them have a zero premium. There's some low premium ones out there, but you're right, excuse me. 
<laughs> most of them were zero premium. So they're, these are managed plans. So the government's saying, okay, you insure these people instead of us, essentially. Um, even a doctor's office, as you'll see them sometimes referred to as Medicare replacement. What's going on? <laughs> so Medicare break into our <laughs> um, it's Medicare replacement insurance. Sometimes they're called that. You, you're essentially going with Medicare Advantage. You're letting them, the private insurance company, uh, manage your health care. They have to offer at least as much as original Medicare offers. Um, what makes them different, though, is the networks. The fact that um, the networks, you don't have that option as you do in original Medicare to see any doctor who accepts Medicare. <clears throat> Can they deny me on the basis of health to enter their plan? No, they can't. Okay. You can get into a Medicare Advantage. So I, I do want to point out as an American employee, I'm so unaccustomed to seeing only one A on the word advantage. So. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> We're not advertising. Yeah, that. no. Can I interest you in an aviator <laughs> Yeah, so people love the Medicare Advantage for the zero premium. I mean, a Medicare supplement, when you look at that, the, the monthly premium was about 135 or so a month for someone who's 65 years old. So there's a drastic um, difference in the premiums. Medicare Advantage is, again, like our empl employer group plan, it's pay as you go. So when you go to the doctor, you're generally going to have a copay. If you get something like a knee injection, you're going to have a co-insurance. You're going to pay 20%. That can get expensive on Medicare Advantage. You pay as you go. Durable equipment, you're definitely going to have a copay there. And sometimes the copays are higher than 20, you know, they're they can be they can be expensive. Um, cancer um, is can be expensive on Medicare Advantage because again, the injections are usually 20% co-insurance. So that would be chemo. Mm -hmm. Now there is a cap on all of these plans, a maximum out of pocket to protect you. So when you're comparing plans and, and you know looking at one plan over another and making a decision, you'll that's something that's important to compare is the maximum out of pocket cost. There's all kinds of variables to look at. It's a complete mixed bag. But some will have um, a very strong dental or hearing or vision benefit that goes with it. Others may have a Part B give back that you refer to where they're actually going to give you $20 back. Um, everything is, um, like I said, just kind of a mixed bag. You figure out what's important to you. Like, I really need a strong dental benefit this year because I'm going to get an implant. Well, make sure it has implant coverage and you probably want to pick a, a plan that has a high uh, dental benefit. If you have a lot of health care concerns with Medicare Advantage, you want to, first of all, ensure that your doctors that you care about are in the network. That's very important. You would pro probably also want to take a look at the specialist copay amount if you see a lot of specialists. Um, just scroll the entire, there's a lineup um, that you'll look at for each plan. It's called the summary of benefits. Line item by line item, compare one plan to another, pick out what's important to you and choose your plan that way. So if you're, you know, you take time, if you're buying a house, if you're buying a new car, <laughs> you need to spend at least a comparable amount of time looking at your Medicare plans to make sure you're signing up for the right one for you. We had a question come in about uh, Advantage plans. Uh, are they, are Advantage plans tied to the city where I live? If I move to a new city, might I have to change Advantage plans? They're actually by zip code. That's why you always see that in those Medicare commercials. What's your zip code? Is one of the first questions. So generally speaking, it's by county. Okay. But you know, the zip code specifically is what can make you go from one plan to another, depending on where you live. And if you move, you do have to change your plan. And that would be a time special enrollment period where you could basically change that anytime. It would be effective the first of the following month. So like if I live in like a Dallas Fort Worth, I might have a lot of choices. If I move to, you know, main street, main town, uh, Oklahoma, I may have less choices. That's true. And for that reason, a lot of people in rural areas do end up staying with original Medicare and then they get a supplement to go along with it. Okay because they may not have all the Medicare Advantage choices. And when I say about the networks, and you know, I, I don't mean to be negative about it, but just be aware of it, because it is the number one complaint about Medicare Advantage. You could even have, say, for example, a surgery scheduled actually on the books, 
And um, you know, a doctor or even a hospital network can leave can leave the network mid year. I mean, you hear that on you know the news of a big hospital network leaving certain insurance plan networks. So you you don't have that with original Medicare. Original Medicare, any doctor who accepts Medicare, which is 96% of all uh, doctors who see adults, um, accept Medicare, you can see any of those doctors, not only in your own community, but if you want to travel and see Mayo Clinic in Phoenix or Rochester, you could do that if you're on original Medicare with a supplement. I have a question because we're seeing all these things about balance billing and the what is the new act that know what you pay act or whatever it's called now we're no surprise with that yeah so if i'm on original medicare with the supplement plan and i go to the mayo clinic can they balance bill me no because well the supplement's going to pick up anything that medicare doesn't cover as long okay. as it's medically necessary uh the supplement i mean this is getting into the nitty-gritty but they are not managing your care mm -hmm. Whereas a Medicare Advantage, they are managing your care. Okay. I mean, we're used to that as employer group. Right. Blue Cross is, is making a decision whether or not you can have an MRI. Um, but when you buy a supplement, the supplement is simply paying the co-pays deductibles that Medicare doesn't cover. So I talked about that Medicare summary notice. If you, you know, say say you have a procedure and, and you, you get a bill from the doctor, that's a shock that you aren't expecting. You don't go look to your supplement. Why wasn't this covered? You look to your Medicare summary notice. Medicare is the one who's made the decision to cover it or not cover it. If Medicare doesn't cover a procedure, your supplement's not going to cover it either. They only cover what Medicare, you know, Medicare covers it and they pick up the extra costs, the co-pays, the deductibles. Is there some sort of an appeal process if you think there it's is. been covered by Medicare? There is, and 50% of appeals are are reversed. Oh, cool. So, and the Did appeal you know? form is very easy. Did you know as well? I had somebody recently who, um, for some reason, Medicare didn't cover their colonoscopy. And she, what? Yeah, she called me and told me about it. I said, oh no, that needs to be appealed. So print it off the form. Build it out. This was medically necessary. This is, you know, the different reasons, whether it was diagnostic or preventative. And it was reversed. Did you know? So, but again, you look to your Medi Medicare summary notice if you're on a supplement because Medicare is in charge. Okay. So that's a lot. Any more questions about the advantage and the supplement plans? I think no. we've had a pretty thorough review. So coming up on our Next topic we're going to cover, one, one that's kind of been difficult with Medicare, but I think from what Evan is telling me, it's getting better. The dreaded dental insurance. Right, right. <laughs> so for the longest time, nobody seemed to want to cover, you know, retirees' teeth. I don't know why they're part of your body. They should be covered like everything else, but it was really hard to find good coverage. It's still not great, but it's getting better. So if you're not yet eligible for Medicare, um, there are a few options. MetLife does offer our retirees retiree dental insurance. Um, it's zip code rated, like she was talking about the Advantage plans. It's generally speaking, pretty high dollar benefit. You pay a pretty high monthly premium and for a low yearly benefit. So it's not great. And most people opt out of their retiree dental insurance. Um, another thing is that uh, the AA Credit Union has a dental club. It's like through uh, Benefit Services of America. It's not really insurance. It's like you're a member of this network. And if you go to doctors in that network, you're going to going to receive your dental treatment at a reduced rate. Costco has a similar program. A lot of people sign up for that. Um, another option is dental schools. Hey, you can be a guinea pig. And a lot of people actually get pretty good care. Um, Patrick used to always say, once the bleeding stops, your teeth will be <laughs> But, you know, um, you, we've talked to quite a few people that have gone to the dental schools and they like that option. If you're in a big metropolitan area with a teaching hospital, they're all observed by, you know, a qualified dentist and you generally get pretty good care. Um, there's also the Cobra Dental, which we discussed earlier. So most 
retirees, I would say probably upwards of 90% choose to COBRA their dental coverage, even if they're eligible for Medicare and keep that dental coverage for 18 months because it's pretty good coverage. And the COBRA dental, because our dental coverage is not subsidized by the company to the same extent as our medical coverage, the COBRA dental is pretty affordable and comparable to what you would be paying for some of the dentals that you could get um, you know, through Medicare or with the advantage. Well, the advantage would be included, but if you add a dental to your supplement plan or something, you know, the cost for a COBRA dental right now is around $35 a month or something in that ballpark. So it's not, you know, too expensive for most people. And most people do actually choose to keep it. So um, according to Evan, many Medicare Advantage plans now offer a pretty generous dental benefit. And sometimes it's even higher than what the company is offering. It is. And in fact, it's for people that leave, choose to leave the employer group plan and go with Medicare Advantage, that's often the reason. Some of the um, Medicare Advantage plans, this has really changed just in the last year or two, um, offer what's called first dollar coverage now, and that means it's not a copay situation. Um, like now in our plan, we might be able to at AA, we would say have a crown, and we would still walk out the door paying $500 ourselves. But with first dollar coverage, they may offer, say, for example, a $2,000 benefit. They're paying from the first dollar. So there is no copay until you get to the $2,000. And then after that, you'd be paying on your own. But if a person has an implant or, you know, a couple of crowns they need taken care of, uh, I have a few people I know who have chosen to leave the employer group plan and go to Medicare Advantage. Beginning, I circle back. Don't make that your whole reason. <laughs> make sure you consider Irma. You know, you don't want to be caught off guard on that and paying this huge amount for your Part B. It would exceed any benefit you'd get from the Dell. And then just, and, you know, being aware of the networks and different situations with Medicare Advantage that the whole plan works for you and not just the Dell. Okay, and then finally. Oh, the other, you and I talked about it. Um, it's some dental, dentist office. If you really love your dentist, is just make sure they don't have an in-house plan. Sometimes dentists have their own in-house plan. That's a good option. Mm -hmm. And yeah, well, I know my dentist, he offers a program where if I exhaust my benefit from AA, that program would kick in and I just pay a low amount every month for that. So, right, right. Um, so if you choose a Medicare, Advantage plan, they have some pretty good dental options now, which is great to hear. Um, if you choose a Medicare supplement plan, there, your advisor might also know about other options. Right. But so, it wouldn't be covered under the umbrella. You'd be paying separate for it, but there are more options now that way. Well, right. right. And Medicare supplement, just to remember, it's it's just on the medical piece. So prescription drug, you're going to have to buy a standalone uh, prescription drug plan separately and dental hearing vision. If you want those products, you'd have to buy those separately. But they are available now, which is good to know. OK, so we covered the scary world of uh, retiree dental coverage. <laughs> uh, now let's talk a little bit about vision. So basically, regular Medicare doesn't cover vision. Um, Regular Medicare only covers like the medical stuff related to your eyes. So if it's related to diabetes or um, diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, right, macular degeneration. So um, it's good to keep that in mind because if you use glasses, contacts, that's not really going to be covered. Um, you can choose a Medigap plan. Um, if you choose a Medigap plan, you need to purchase it dental vision for those type of things. Right. Um, otherwise, be prepared to pay as you go. And I think that's what a lot of people do. Um, a lot of people, unless they have major eye issues, decide that the amount that they would spend on the dental, it's just as good to pay as you go. Um, if you choose an Advantage plan, there's a lot now that will include, like Evan told us earlier, something that includes dental vision and hearing. Right. So right. any more to add about? No, vision? just that a lot of times if you do buy a dental plan, you can get a vision rider for $7 a month. 
that's something to consider. Yeah, that's not that bad. So most people would not find that too objectionable. Mm -hmm. thing. All right, so uh, we're getting to our question and answer period. Patrick, do we have any more that have been submitted since we answered the last few? We do. Um, wow. There are two uh, related. I'm going to go ahead and take both of those. The first is uh, explain that again about Part A and an HSA. So you can sign up for Part A, and it's probably not going to affect 98% of the people. However, there is a small group, let's say 2%, um, that I've signed up for an HSA using the core plan, medical plan. The great thing about an HSA is you fund it while you're working, and when you leave, you can take that health savings account with you and use it to pay for health expenses, including uh, Medicare premiums. So if you have an HSA and you don't stumble into it, you know you got an HSA because you have to go through some hoops to get there. If you have an HSA, you should not sign up for Part A. If the clerk at, at uh, Social Security says, oh, I'm just going to sign you up for Part A, say no, 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 no. Um, but it's not something that you're going to stumble into and hurt yourself. Um, if you've got an HSA, you know it because you're there intentionally. Uh, that's so on the HSA, um, that's, that's the only time. The other question on an HSA was, I am in an HSA. Now, I found, uh, and it's a good plan, um, even though I switched from the standard medical and I was happy with it, should I go back to the standard medical one year prior to make sure, yeah, you're good, that as long as you don't sign up for the Part A, you can take that core plan all the way through to the end of the two, to the day you retire, and it's not gonna hurt you, and it's gonna let you fund that HSA, yes? Okay, one caveat to that is, if you sign up for Medicare, after you turn 65, you know, you're 65 and a half, you're 80, anytime after age 65, there is, have to make it confusing, a six month go back. I won't even call it a look back, a go back. So they actually make your part A effective date six months before the day you ask for uh -huh. it. They don't make it before you turn 65, they won't look back that far. So you can take, you can have your HSA contributions going on up until say you're 66 and a half, then on your 70th birthday, then you can sign up for part A because it's going to go back six months to 66 and a half. I mean, you said 70 meant 67. So wait, 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 I'm sorry, did I say that wrong? If I say you're 70. Okay. They're going to make your part A effective date 59 and a half. And six months. I'm sorry, I did say that wrong. Okay. It's a, yeah, I did. Six month look back. Okay. So, yeah. If I'm trying to time that right, yeah. I have to try and have my uh, HSA contribution stop six months before my right. my uh, actual. So uh, what I recommend to people is just the annual enrollment, make your decision. <laughs> you know, that's. Am I going to retire this year? Yeah. So get out. And then get out of six months into the year. Right. After you right. Okay. Drop that plan. Now you can keep the core. But just quit contributing to an HSA. All right. Yeah. Good and that comes into play for other reasons too. If you for some reason don't sign up for Part A, they do make your um, Part A effective date six months prior if you're enrolling after age 65. Uh -huh. No sooner than age 65, though. Okay. Okay. And we get a lot of questions because of this. HSA issue because American Airlines has another plan called the Plus Plan that has an account that you can take with you and use to offset your Medicare expenses. However, that plan has an account called the Health Reimbursement Account, not the Health Savings Account. The Health Savings Accounts are governed by Medicare, the IRS, and there are rules about you know what you can have when you're signed up for Medicare. So that's why this whole Part A issue comes into play. But with the PLUS plan and the health reimbursement account, that's a, an account that's basically made up by your company. It's not governed by the IRS. There's no implication. If you have this account, you can sign up for Medicare Part A when you turn 65. No issues with the PLUS plan. Right. The only issues are with the account associated with the core plan, which is the HSA. So HSA core plan, don't sign up for Part A. HRA plus plan, if you have that, you don't have to worry. You can do whatever you want to do. 
Oh, cool. All right. Well, this is a compound question. I'll ask them one at a time. Um, I am uh, uh, currently uh, Medicare eligible um, and I'm thinking of retiring. Can my dependent under the age 60 to 26 get a, a retiring medical insurance if I go with Medicare? They can get COBRA. They can get COBRA. They will be eligible for COBRA. Yeah, because they will so, follow you. If they're still working, I think you have to be on the plan for your, as an active employee, you have to be on the plan for your dependents to be on the plan. So if you go with Medicare, they're going to be offered COBRA immediately, even though you're still active, because in order for them to have the active benefits, you also have to have the active benefits. So if I'm 66 and I go to Medicare because I found a uh, an advantage plan that's going to give me all this stuff, and uh, but I also have this this 22 year old. Do the math on that, by the way. Oh no, uh, I have this 22 year old, and uh, if I go to Medicare, they're going to lose their American active employee coverage because I'm not in the plan and they can't have it unless I'm there. Right. OK, but they will be offered COBRA and they may be eligible for COBRA for a little bit longer. We'll have to check on yeah, that. Yeah, but definitely eligible COBRA, but definitely not eligible for COBRA. And then if I go ahead and retire and I'm on Medicare, because I'm not on the retiree plan, it follows that they can't be on the retiree plan either, even though they would be eligible as a as a qualified dependent if I were in, in the plan. If you wanted to pay the big bucks to be yeah. on the retiree yeah. plan. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a don't do it. Now maybe they can use some of their own income to help pay the COBRA costs. Speaking, <laughs> speaking of big bucks, the next question is, well, what is the current AA retiree medical insurance cost? Okay, the current AA retiree medical oh. insurance cost is, I mentioned it earlier, but you may have just joined us, for an employee only $2,171 a month. Ouch. Okay, employee plus one, 4000 $342 a month, double edge. For employee plus two or more, $6,513 a month. So that's why not a whole lot of people sign up for these plans. And guess what? I don't have the official numbers for 2024, but they are going up. So <laughs> they, how did they even go up from that? That's they are they're, nice some type. Okay. It's crazy. Okay. So the the next question is back to Irma. Is Irma recapping it every year? Yes. So if you get that with Irma, and be, let's say you sold an investment property, so you have one year where you're paying four hundred dollars or so a month. The next year they'll recalculate it. Now they'll be doing a new look back. It'll be to the two prior years, two year look back. And as, uh, as long as your income was under 97,000 or it'll probably be 102 next year, uh, under $102,000 a year, then you would just go back to the standard rate, which right now is 164.90 a month. And also just to reiterate, <clears throat> you do pay that same amount, 164.90, Part B premium if you go Medicare Advantage or if you stick with original Medicare with a supplement, both ways you pay Part B. Okay. There's no getting out of it. Yeah, they yeah, want yeah. that money. And if you are on Social Security, they're going to deduct it from your Social right. Security. You yeah. don't have to worry about it, except your Social Security will be a little bit less. Right. So calculate that in when you're calculating your retirement income. Um, but if you're not on Social Security yet, you're waiting till 70 or whatever, they'll direct bill you. Don't worry. Every three months. Every three months. Yeah, they do it quarterly. So. Right. Okay, we've got a four part question that talks about switching from standard to a uh, uh, advantage okay. plan and back. Okay. So the first part of it is, can, uh, can I get back to original uh, Medicare without underwriting if I leave an advantage plan? Okay, this is another one that's a little bit tricky and convoluted. So if you're, you know, you want to try both out, what any agent would recommend would be start with a supplement. Then you could go to advantage. And every year you'll have the opportunity to go to Advantage with annual enrollment, which is October 15th through December 7th. So every year you'll have the opportunity to assess, oh, do I want to switch to Medicare Advantage? Okay, now to answer the question, you've made that switch. Now you're on Medicare Advantage. Can you go back to Medicare Supplement? And the answer is maybe. So 
Definitively. You, you can go back to Medicare supplement a couple of different ways. One would be if you, you pass a medical underwriting. And one of the questions is, do you have a surgery schedule? And I mean, something simple like that. Have you been told you need a hip replacement? Well, that, they don't want to pay for your hip yeah. replacement. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's kind of understandable. Um, but anyway, beyond medical underwriting, the other way you can go back is what's called a trial period. And this is kind of confusing. So you can you can Google this too later if you'd like on Medicare.gov. It's the trial, let's see, what do they call it? Trial Medigap period is what I would Google. Um, during your trial period, they let you leave Medicare supplement to try Medicare Advantage as long as you go back within one year, then you can go back without medical underwriting, without medical questions, but you can only do that one time. So that's why we say, well, if you're really unsure, start with supplement. Mm -hmm. um, supplement does go up in price as you get older. So go on it maybe the first few years and maybe there'll be a year, a good time to try it. Might be a year that you have some dental work that you need done and you wanna take advantage of one of those $2,000 first dollar coverage plans. That might be a year to try it. Try it out. Make sure though that you know you have to go back and you could you the way it works is you go back to the exact same plan you were in um, as long as it's available. You go back to the same plan. Um, as long as you do that within one year, there's no medical questions. If you wait over that, then there's medical questions. There's there's actually other caveats to it. It gets so convoluted. So I would just recommend if you're considering um, the trial period to look at that in the Medicare and you handbook. Um, just you know, read it thoroughly. Make sure you understand it because there's, there's a couple other little caveats to it. It gets very convoluted, but that's that's the gist of it right there. Or if you're a Medicare advisor, <laughs> yeah, really. uh, which explains the next part of this question, okay. because the question is, I was in advantage, went back to the standard plan of Medicare. Um, if I try an advantage again, am I subject to underwriting? Yes. OK, so you only get that trial. You only get it once in your whole life. Bummer. And oftentimes people will call for their parents. My mom's in this really extensive Medicare supplement. I want her to you know, go on Medicare Advantage. And I heard that she can do that for a year, but what happens is people forget. Yeah. 20 years have passed, so maybe she already did use her trial, right? So it's just, it's one time. Or they get really busy taking care of their parent and forget mm -hmm. to switch them back. Or right, whatever. right, right. So I mean, you know, for the most part, you should enroll in a plan and just plan to stick in it. But yes, there is that trial right where you could go off for a year. And remember you were talking about the, some of those little caveats. This might be one of them. Okay. Um, I have had an event which triggers open and uh, special enrollment okay. uh, because I moved. Right. Am I subject to underwriting for my new plan? No. Okay. Well, 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 wait. If they're going from Advantage to Supplement? Well, they may be going from Advantage plan uh, with Blue Cross to an Advantage okay. plan with Aetna and my new town. Now, <laughs> oh, advantage to advantage, definitely not. Okay. You do so. not have medical underwriting with Medicare Advantage. Medicare supplement, it's kind of regulated by the state too. So um, I have to be careful when I talk about Medicare supplement, whether there would be underwriting or not. Most cases when you move, there would not be, but you would need to check with the state that you're in for so that. That may be a little loophole. Then. That could be, but, but if you've never switched though, you would still have that trial period for one year at Medicare Advantage. But if you're living in this big city and you're on a Medicare Advantage plan, then it works great. But then you have to move out to the country and there's not much of a network. So you want to switch to the supplement plan and maybe you've already used the trial period. You should be able to get that the supplement. Event might let you yeah, get you should be able to get in the supplement in that case. I just have to be careful because the right. state, there's different laws um, by different states, but in most cases of moving. And again, just a reminder, if you move, if you're in Medicare Advantage and you move, out of your county, you may have to switch anyway. If you move out of state, you definitely need to switch. Okay. And that would be a special enrollment period where you could do that at any time and the effective date would be the first day of the following month. And speaking of states, which states are you licensed in? I am licensed in uh, Texas, Arizona, Colorado, Alaska, and California. Wow. wow. So All right. if anyone wants to talk to Evan, we're not gonna put a number up there because a lot of people might call from areas where she's not licensed, but if you want her number 
and she's given me permission oh, to share it out. So um, call me and I'll pass her number along yeah, if you would like to consult with her. <laughs> I mean, you're in one of the states where she's licensed. Um, okay, so okay. Uh, do you have I any questions? We've got six oh, more. Oh my goodness. Yeah, um, so I think we just answered this one. Uh, uh, with changing from advantage to advantage, no underwriting. Yeah, right. All right. You have to do it during an annual enrollment period. You can't just do it anytime you feel like it. My husband retired last December, not from AA, and I enrolled uh, him through AA for insurance, but did not sign up for Medicare. No penalty, right? Right. Okay. You just need to fill that form out for both him and you when you retire. At 85. All right, or whatever. <laughs> and someone who wanted to give a shout out to Cost Plus Drugs, the Mark Cuban uh, drug plan. Uh, look it up. Uh, it's a it's a really good uh, option for people that are shopping for drugs. No, that's I didn't want to bring it up because I felt like Part D talk was getting so convoluted. But yes, that's a great resource to look that up. Always compare your drug prices, and many have heard, but some have it of GoodRx.com. Mm -hmm. um, even once you're on Medicare. Before you just put down your prescription drug card at CVS or wherever you go, before you leave the house, I recommend getting on GoodRx.com and checking the price. It might be cheaper. You get on GoodRx, you type in the drug name, you scroll down to the dosage, click it, you get a coupon right there that gives the price and location, print it, take it to the pharmacist. Yep. So even if you're on Medicare, you can use those resources. You can, and often they are cheaper. Okay. Yep. 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 You know, so we will add some of those resources to our presentation yep. for the next time as well. Singlecare.com is another. Singlecare. So we got Cost Plus Drugs, you guys. Did Rx and Single Singlecare. Singlecare. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. This is a two part question. I know half the answer. You may know the other half. Okay. I am inherited money from my parents. Um, is that going to be taxable for my federal insurance? Is it going to be considered income for Irma? The first part is federal taxes. No, it doesn't count. Uh, it, it with, with the one one exception we'll talk about. It doesn't count as taxable income. There is some money you can inherit that if your parents had taken it out or your parents had taken it out, they would have had to pay taxes. And the classic example is a regular 401k. If your, your mom has money in a 401k and she takes it out, she has to pay tax on that. If you inherit that 401k because she would have had to pay tax, you have to pay tax. It's called uh, tax in lieu. Uh, but otherwise, you know, all the money from the house, the, the stock accounts, any of that, uh, it's absolutely uh, free of federal income tax. Does it count for Irma? I don't know. I'm not 100% either. Okay. Sure. Good. Yeah. Ask if, the IRS. Ask good. your tax advisor. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Ask, it's ask. modified adjusted gross income. Right. It's not AGI. It's modified. Yeah. That's, and I think that's that includes part of not inherited not, money. So. Gosh, I'm sorry. I don't know the that's, answer. That's on. a. That's a. We're going to look that up. Question. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, this next one, I'm not really sure I understand the question, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it we'll anyway. Try. I'm on the plus plan with a, a RHA, HRA. Or HRA, but also contributing to an HSA for retirement. And I'm not sure how you do that. Do I still sign up for part A um, six months before my retirement? I don't know how they would be contributing I, to yeah, the HSA. Unless their spouse has an HSA at their employment. Right. It's so if they're doubled insured, like AA is their primary and their spouses is their secondary, maybe they have access to an HSA and they wouldn't sign up for part A. They just wait, you know? Yeah. Because um, there's no there's no downside to waiting, really, to sign up for part A. The, the one factor that could come into play here, and I've had this question asked before and I've researched it, is I'm, my, I'm not 65, my husband is. I'm contributing to an HSA. Again, the husband's over age 65. He's actually benefiting from that HSA, but that's actually okay. Yeah. You can still you can still contribute. So he can use that money, right? And have his part A. Signed up for Medicare, yeah. but you're not. And right. He's getting that benefit. He's getting the benefit, benefit of the HSA. Right. So in some ways, you would maybe think that wouldn't be okay, but actually that 
situation is okay. Because you're making the contribution that you don't have. And to I'm not raise. 65 yet. Okay. And that, so and that's like my factor in that there. That might be her scenario. Yeah, that might is be her scenario. <clears throat> All right. So. Okay, I have a question. Yes. That we get from a lot of employees who are wondering I'm going to retire. I'm an airline employee. I may not like to travel as much as I did when I first signed up. May not like people, but I'm planning on going abroad, taking my dog, going out to the country, you know, since being a hermit in Europe or something like that. If I'm in Europe, will my Medicare plan cover me? What about travel abroad? Okay. Medicare? So in Medicare, talk about med original Medicare first. That would be original Medicare with a Medicare supplement, hopefully. Hopefully you wouldn't do it without a supplement. Um, that has stronger coverage, actually, for traveling overseas. Um, you, It's emergency coverage. So most people don't want to go get a checkup when they're, you know, in Rome or whatever anyway. So it's emergency coverage. Every plan has their own. You would need to look at that in their summary as far as the international component to it. But it's... Uh, a benefit that's fifty thousand dollars, generally speaking, with a twenty percent copay. And again, this is Medicare supplement. Um, it does cover you internationally, but it's a lifetime benefit. So, if you, God forbid, had two emergencies, one trip, um, two thousand twenty-three, for example, and you spend the fifty thousand dollars, you would not have that available to you in two thousand twenty-four. So, you would might um, would need to consider changing supplement plans just so you would continue to have that benefit. So it's a it's a lifetime benefit, but it's attached to the plan. So if you it's attached to the plan, plan so if you, you burn up the fifty thousand dollars, you don't have any more benefit. It's not a calendar year. Okay. But if I switch plans the next year to a different company, I might have another right. fifty thousand available. Right. You'd be subject, you could be subject to medical underwriting, right. but it is a one time fifty thousand dollar benefit. Um, and you, again, you would need to read that in the Medicare supplement guide, what the um, exact benefit would be, because that, that is a part of the core standardized benefit for medical care in the United States. So it might be better to get a travel insurance. So I always recommend and travel then, insurance. And then just not worry about changing your supplement plan if it's a good one. Right. If you've exhausted that benefit. Right. right. On that chart that we were showing earlier, it talks about whether or not there's the international travel insurance, and four of them don't have that. Okay. Emergency. So that, yeah, it's again, there's so many caveats to Medicare. Medicare supplement is standardized, but the international piece is considered um, a separate added benefit. So that's not not one of the standardized pieces where they're all the same. So it's standardized for medical care in the United States when you're looking at Medicare supplement. There are some benefits that are sometimes available, like gym membership, that's not considered standardized. So you want to compare that. And then the other piece is international travel. So look at that in your Medicare supplement and see what the benefit is. But then switching gears now to Medicare supplement, or excuse me, Medicare Advantage, if you go that route, um, also look at the benefit package and your summary of benefits. It will talk about international travel. Generally speaking, um, most of the plans will cover emergencies, um, traveling overseas, but they'll pretty much make you come home. Once you get past the crisis, you won't be able to stay in the hospital there for months and tend to a broken leg or that type of thing. They will get you through the emergency and then you would need to come home. And they won't, by the way, pay for your way to get home. That would be up to you to get yourself back to your home state. So that emergency facelift. Oh, no. No, so that won't get, come yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, do you recommend a specific broker to sign up with the plans? I'm kind of familiar with Boomer's Benefits. Are they any good? And then asking about Evan's coverage. So. Boomer's Benefits, I don't know that Evan commented as well, but I get very good feedback mm -hmm. on them. We don't recommend um, specific brokers or anything, but I do keep a list of brokers or companies that other flight tenants have used, and I have not heard anything bad about Boomer Benefits. No, I haven't they're, they're pretty well um thought of in out in the marketplace and there's one called via benefits that aa works with they'll get the job done we like to say but they are not quite as flight attendant friendly in terms of they want to get you through it they don't spend as much time with you walking you through it all 
from what I've heard, you know, but they will get the job done and AA contracts with them to help their employees find Medicare plans. Um, another one um, is called Select Quote Senior that some of our people have used. Oh, yeah. and, okay. um, those, so those are the ones I've mainly heard about. What about you? No, yeah, those same ones. Um, just, you know, getting recommendations from family members we trust and friends who have worked with other agents. You know, and again, and most people know this, but um, we are paid, agents are paid a commission from the insurance company. So it does not cost you anything at all to work with an agent and they can help walk you through the process of enrolling in Medicare, you know, get you through those deadlines and those forms and get the forms in your hands for you. And then uh, meet either in person or Zoom, whatever you prefer, or just over the phone and talk about your plan choices. It's a good idea to have a list of your doctors available before you even talk to an agent. That way, one of the first steps often is to see if your doctors are in network with the different plans. And your medications. And absolutely, your medications. And it's funny because your agent really won't ask, well, what medications are you taking? Um, they won't ask that intrusive questions, but for them to really do the work for you, um, if you have the exact medications and dosage, I mean, write down the letter of what you take that will help them uh, find the right plan for you. We usually fra phrase it as, uh, is the drug piece an important piece to you? It's just kind of a delicate thing. So if you can just provide that to them, that will be a benefit to you. Because they can't ask for any personal health information. So you have to be willing to give them the right information. It, right, it's kind of fragile. So yeah, anything that you can provide that will help them find a good plan for you. All right, this is convoluted, but I'm going to uh, synthesize it down to a, I am out on unpaid IOD. Um, my insurance uh, with American ended. Um, I can't afford COBRA, uh, and, but I am over 65. Can I switch to Medicare? Yes. Yeah, you can switch to Maybe Medicare. Maybe you want to do it sooner rather than later, if that's your choice. If you're within your COBRA window, you're probably within your Medicare special enrollment period, and you're going to need the form to show that you, you know, and especially have coming coverage up, from the company. You don't want to wait too long if that's what you're going to do. Right, yeah. you can switch. Um, exactly, don't wait too long. There's forms to fill out, and, and you, you can And if get you wait too long, you could get the late enrollment penalty. And what I you still have a fair amount of time to get that done, eight months, but still you don't want to go without insurance. Right. You don't right. Issue. If you're on an IOD, obviously work comp's paying for part of it, but for your personal health portion, you're going to need coverage. So and even yes, on, it's an option. Even on that topic, if a person is considering retiring soon or they know they're going to retire soon, um, you could enroll in Medicare beginning January 1st. That would be a time when maybe you do want to go ahead and enroll in Medicare and leave employer group because you know, why pay two deductibles or two maximum out of pockets if things happen? You're, you're on the AA plan, say January and February, and maybe something happened, you have to go to the maximum out of pocket, and then you're going into Medicare. March, you have a new maximum out of pocket, depending on what type of plan you went into. So that could be a time when you would want to go ahead and leave AA insurance a little bit early. And yeah, that's a good idea. For the sake of timing, everybody needs to know that you're active um, employee benefits end at midnight on your last day as an active employee. There's no carryover through the end of the month or anything like that. Yeah, so it comes up. most people decide to, this is one of the main reasons that most people decide to retire and have their last day as an active employee be the last day of the calendar month. And then they set it up so that their Medicare begins on the first day of the next calendar month because Medicare likes to start on the first day. It month. always starts on the first. So um, that's how most people time it. And a lot of people use the Medicare if they're over 65 and planning on retiring. They use that Medicare enrollment period to their advantage because they say, OK, December 31st is going to be my last day as an active employee. And hello, 2024, January 1st is going to be my first day as a retiree, my first day on Medicare, and so on. And your so, first day paying Part B. Your first day paying Part B. Right, exactly. All right. Um, the, uh, an another question about underwriting, and that is, uh, if I'm 
on regular original Medicare, and I happen to be traveling at open enrollment, and can I switch to a supplemental plan uh, under the trial without underwriting? I don't think the travel impacts that question. No, I think it's no. I mean, we you can enroll just over the phone. That's no problem. I enroll people all the time on the phone. Um, you would have to, you know, receive an email and acknowledge that you're enrolling in a plan. But as long as you're trying Medicare for, so if you would start in the supplement, went to Medicare Advantage, had it for a year, you can go back. Is that? I think that was. Yeah, I think story. that's it. Okay. And I think the travel was just. Uh, uh, throwing that in there. Um, I think that that is the end of our questions. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. Well, thanks everybody for sitting in and out through all the ins and outs and the Medicare alphabet soup and all that. Soup. We want to thank Evan Jellisma for coming and being our subject matter expert today. Well, thank you for um, having me. Phoenix based flight attendant and uh, Patrick Hancock, as always, the uh, uh, retirement expert extraordinaire, especially with the financial stuff. And then Ankit for being our tech guy. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ankit. <laughs> So um, once again, if you have questions, I have Evan's number. I can call her. If I don't know the answer, one of us will get you your answer. So uh, retirement at APFA.org, 817-540-0050. Um, or extension 8490. Um, so thanks again and have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye.